Howdy folks and welcome to another Future in Space Hangout. My name is Tony Darnell from deepastronomy.space and today we are diving into one of the four concepts that are destined to become among our next great space telescopes. We've had hangouts on some of the other candidates before. We've had one on Habex and Lubar and the Origin Space Telescope. And today we are rounding out our tour with the Lynx Space Telescope, a revolutionary X-ray observatory that will transform our understanding of the universe. Today we will be talking with members of the mission to get caught up on the latest progress of the design, the mission itself, and some of the science that will be done by Lynx if it is selected in the upcoming 2020 Astronomy Decadal Survey. You've heard about these many, many times before, the Decadal Survey, that is. Now, these Hangouts are endorsed and sponsored by the American Astronautical Society, whose members work to advance, promote, and support the American advances in aerospace and human spaceflight. And I want to thank them so much for their support, because without these, we couldn't do them. So thank you, American Astronautical Society. They're also endorsed by the American Astronomical Society, and but they are primarily focused on the Astro Coffee Hangout as well. Now, before we start, I want to let you know that we are streaming live on YouTube, Twitch, and Periscope. I'm sorry, Facebook, but you don't play nice with others, so I can't include you here. And we encourage you to interact with our guests in the live chat, which is on the YouTube channel. And I also have a Discord server, the Deep Astronomy uh, Discord server. The link to that is in the description box of the YouTube video. And if you're watching, uh, so please get on there. And, and I'm always on 24-7, so I can see you there, and we can maybe chat about other things as well. Now, if you're watching the VOD, then please don't let that stop you from leaving questions and comments in the comment section of the platform you're using, whichever it is, and I will try to get to them myself uh, and maybe answer them myself uh, after the fact. And we are also posting the audio portion of this Hangout in, uh, to our Deep Astronomy podcast, which is on Anchor.fm, and it goes to all kinds of different podcast servers like Spotify and all that. So um, I want to welcome you guys to listen, and if you're listening on this, welcome. I'm glad to have you here. Now, if you would like a, a robust way of getting notified of these Hangouts and other videos that are up, uploaded each time we start something, any new content, then please go to deepastronomy.space and register your email with us because you can choose your notifications of all the different kinds of things we post. And I've been using it for a year now, and it works way better than the notifications on YouTube or wherever you happen to be. So please, uh, if you put your uh, email address in there, I promise I won't use it for anything but that. So thank you guys very much. Um, okay, let's go ahead and get started. Let me bring up our astronomical Brady Bunch. Uh, so here we all are. <laughs> and um, uh, my uh, my co-host, Dr. Harley Thronson, is back with us this week. Thank you. It's good to see you again, Harley. Um, maybe introduce what we're doing here, and, and, and then I'll introduce our guests. Yep, yep. Glad to do so. So you gave an excellent introduction. Uh, once again, to remind folks in the audience who have been really very good at following the, uh, the progress of and the science goals and science of these four big strategic missions, I'll put a little bit in context. I think it was about three years ago, the Astrophysics Division at um, the Science Mission Director at NASA headquarters began funding increasingly detailed, increasingly sophisticated engineering design studies and development of the science program for four major mission concepts that um, I believe early, I believe it's early summer of next year will be submitted to NASA headquarters, which will in turn pass them on off to the National Academies, which will assess them, other, uh, other goals, well, but assess them for their, um, mainly for their science goals and the reasonableness of the, um, of the engineering design. And we'll then report back to NASA resume, sometime in 2020, maybe early 2021, their findings, their observations, their recommendations for the next major mission or missions to follow the current pair of priority astronomical, major astronomical missions, James Webb Space Telescope, which we heard about a couple of weeks ago, and the W first mission. It's a very exciting time for the folks that we have. Um, we have the A team representing Lynx today, so it's a very exciting time for them. A very challenging time for um, for their colleagues on those other missions as well. And so, with that introduction and the importance of what these folks are studying, should we get underway? Introduce yeah. them. 
Okay. Right. Um, I uh need to Harley. I, I just did some adjusting while you were talking. Your mic is very low. So if you, I don't know if you're pointing away from you now or what happened, but you're a lot lower than you were before we started. So if you can maybe look at your mic, I had I I goosed up the volume, but it was not quite enough. And if I don't goose it back down, then the other people are going to blast us. So let's talk about. So let me introduce our guests. Um, I have with me uh, in the panel right next to me in the upper left is um, uh, Karen Gelmas. She is the Lynx study manager for uh, the for the Lynx project, and right next to her is uh, is Kevin McCarley. He's the lead systems engineer. So welcome, guys. <laughs> Good. And also with me is um, Alexi Viklinen. Um, he is the co-chair of the science and technology definition team uh, doing the heavy lifting, aren't you, uh, for links, Alexi? Welcome back. You were here the last Hi. time. Pleased to be here. Oh, good. All right. Um, I think the best place to start, because a lot of us, we, Harley and I have talked with many times and many hangouts about what the decadal survey is. It's sort of the way astronomers decide what they want out of life and they look and they, they they decide that they would like to look at various areas of science what areas is links being considered for and what sort of shortcomings if any is it decided if it's designed to overcome in our current studies of what astronomy is, what's going to be its advances over the current um, x-ray mission like chandra what's going to be its real advances and i think what what is the link science program focused on is that a slightly better way to put it? Oh, mm -hmm. sure. That's good. You're also very, still very low, Harley. <laughs> well, we are making revolutionary advances. So we across the board introduce, introduce increases in capabilities by factors between 100 and 1,000. Uh, so in high resolution spectroscopy, in uh, our ability to detect faint sources, in our ability to map structures in the x-rays. Chandra is currently fault and start. Its effective area for imaging is equivalent to an effective area of 15 inch optical telescope. Uh, so very small. Um, and uh, Lynx will provide uh, almost two orders of magnitude better throughput for high resolution spectroscopy, a factor of a thousand better throughput. So this would bring x-ray astronomy, you know, to uh, to a point where it's able to contribute to all branches of astrophysics, ranging from planets to cosmology to the earliest universe. You know, uh, while you were talking, Alexi, I went ahead and put up the uh, website. Uh, there has this really cool little fade in between uh, Chandra and um, the Einstein X-ray Observatory. And by the way, folks, go to linksobservatory.com. The link to that is in the description box. They've got an awesome website. You got to go check it out. This will tell you everything you wanted to know about links. But w the reason I put that little fade thing up um, is it's, it's the part where it says eyes sharp as a lynx. Uh, it goes between the resolution of five arc seconds to a half an arc second. And this right. is this is kind of what links is going to do compared to Chandra, isn't it? Links is going to increase effective area, so oh, the area, the angular resolution at 5.5 arc second level. So you will be able to see the structures as sharp as on the you know Chandra image, but increase statistics and increase our spectroscopic capabilities by two orders of magnitude. Okay, now why? Okay, the spectroscopic abilities I can see why that's important, but why the what's the extra field of view going to get us? Get you. Extra field of view is going to get us. Uh, well, field of view and throughput, it, it's an ability to detect very faint objects. So one of our major science goals is to understand the origins of black holes in the universe. So every indication is that uh, they have formed very, very early within you know, a few hundred million years from the Big Bang. In the optical, big optical surveys, we are finding huge black holes in very early galaxies there's not enough time for them to grow through normal channels from like stellar mass objects to the masses they have at those redshifts. So something spectacular must be happening in the early universe. And the only way to find out is to reach in sensitivity to those epochs. So Chandra is about 100 times not enough, you know, in sensitivity to, to see there. And Lynx is sized to be able to see the very first generations of the black holes. And it will, and for those of you who 
I mean, when you think when when you see black holes, we're not really looking at the black hole singularity itself, are we? We're looking at something else. What are we looking at when you say see black holes? Well, so black hole, uh, just stepping back, black hole grows primarily through accreting material onto it. As it accretes material, about 10% of the rest energy of that material is radiated in the electromagnetic waves. And much of that radiation is in fact in the X-rays. So as the black hole grows, it actually emits you know, X-rays. And we will be able to see this process for very low mass objects at very high distances, very large distances. Okay, yes. And so when, as black holes tend to uh, accrete material, they, they, they basically are they're sucking stuff in. And that's when you notice... That's when you notice the black hole itself. That's how you can see them. We really can only see them if they're feeding, right? Exactly. So how big did you say these early black holes were? So uh, we don't know what they were. We believe something interesting happens as they change their masses from about 100 solar masses to about 100,000 solar masses. And so links will be able to see the, uh, the black holes with masses 10,000 solar masses. Okay. All right. Um, so Karen, give us a, can you, can you talk a little bit about, so you're the, you're the link study manager. What does that mean? And what kinds of, um, how did you get involved in the project? Let's talk about that a little bit. Well, yeah, I, I mean, I got involved after the project that show had actually already started. Uh, but, but really from a study manager aspect, I'm making sure that all of the study products are, um, put together and are available when they're supposed to be available. Uh, I'm working with our engineering team to uh, do the design of the of the observatory. Kevin, of course, over here is our lead system engineer, and so he's he's making sure that all of our interfaces work and that our design is all integrated. Uh, but then I also uh, am taking a look at the cost and the schedule and all the programmatics for it as well. So, you know, there's a lot of there's a lot of technical work and a lot of programmatic work that's going on just to make sure that it's a feasible design and that the design closes at the end of our all of our analysis. Now, I don't, we, I, I mean, Harley and I have joked in the past about this being kind of a competition or an awards ep awards ceremony where they have a big unveiling and the winner is, you know, uh, but I guess I want to, I want to ask you a little bit about the cost of the mission. Is it something that is, uh, first of all, what do you, what is it estimated to be and, and what will be the lifetime of the mission nominally? We're not, yeah, we're not quite finished with our costing yet, so uh, we don't really want to okay. say a number that's, you know, that that isn't that may, may or may not be accurate, but we are planning for a five-year mission. Okay. With goals to allow to extend it to. 20. So it'll, it'll go up to 20, 20 years. Right. Okay. And and then we and we fully expect it to go beyond twenty, but we'll just with a little bit less capability because we'll you know at that point we'll be aging our solar panels. We won't have the power and all that kind of stuff. So. Okay. Well, then let me just ask a generic. Uh, decadal survey study question then does cost enter into a decision like this or is it more about the science well it's both um, I mean the science the the decadal and, and this is actually my first experience working with the decadal survey so I'm, I'm learning as I go along but <laughs> uh, the the science is key I mean it's got to be compelling science because you know they're going to be recommending you know which of these missions is going to be the next flagship mission for NASA and they, and they want to make sure that we're doing the, the right science. But on top of all that, because, you know, we are, you know, a servant of the of the people and we're a government entity, we have to make sure that we're responsible with our costs as well. And, you know, we don't want our costs to get out of control. So we have to make sure that we have, you know, the right science for uh, an appropriate amount of money. Okay. Well, and, yeah. okay. So right in queue for me getting uh, Kevin involved, uh, Larry Keyes is asking a question, which I'll just go ahead and ask right away, and then I've got another question for you, Kevin. Is the systems engineer responsible for the RFQ? I don't understand what that means. Do you know what that question? What's an RFQ? A request for quote. Oh, is that sure. what you, is that what you mean, Larry? I'm not sure. Okay. Well, getting so Kevin, let me while we're waiting on him to respond in the live chat. Um, I don't know what an RFQ is, Larry. I'm sorry. Um, so, um, where is Lynx going to go uh, in, in orbit in space? Where are we going to put it? And do you want to talk about some of the design considerations for an X-ray telescope? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, we're going to the uh, Sun-Earth L2 
would be in a halo orbit around that stable point in space. And that has a lot of advantages. It's the same place that Webb is going. And compared to Chandra, we can avoid eclipse periods and we can avoid going through the Earth's uh, radiation belts. So that gives us some good advantages being in that location. Yeah, everybody loves yeah. L2. It's, I, wish, yeah. I wish I had bought property there before it got popular. That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> yeah, me too. And I should, uh, I guess, preface my answer that I've been on Link's project for about one year. So I've been learning a lot about X-ray mm -hmm. telescopes and astronomy. I've been doing system engineering for NASA for over 30 years. I've worked a lot of different projects. This is my first time working on a flagship class observatory project. Okay. And what do you mean? And flagship class actually means something. You want to just talk about what that means, Karen? Yeah, I mean, generally, you know, the, the large permissions, you know, think James Webb, of course, the Hubble, Chandra are one of the flagships. Those things, you know, these very large um, missions that last a long time and they, you know, go out to far reaches and produce a whole lot of science. So generally, it's a, it's a, it's a cost classification. So okay. generally, you know, you know, five billion dollars and up. Okay, let's uh, let's talk about the time scale real quick because Condor Boss is asking: Will links get to L two before JWST? Um, <laughs> <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> um, hmm. Let's let's not go down that particular. Road. Not okay. Well, okay, but let us not comparing it to JWST. When do you anticipate? All things being equal, you get selected, you stay on budget and on schedule. When do you anticipate being? parked at the L2 point, ready to look at x-rays. All right, so our, our preliminary schedule that was actually put together several months ago shows us um, getting to our, you know, phase A or the start of the project, uh, the, the first quarter of fiscal year 25, which is October of 24. And then launch, our, our expected launch date is around December of 2036. So, so it's about an 11 so years, yes. about an 11-year mission, right? Yes, Condor Boss. But, but, you know, in all that, we have, te you know, technologies that we're developing, and we have some very complex instruments and optics that we're developing, and it just takes a long time to put all that together. Okay. All right. Yes, I know. And uh, uh, for a $5 billion or pl whatever a flagship scale observatory, mm -hmm. it definitely is a lot of work. Uh, so yeah, flagship, and, and just, Tony, though, also, flagship is not about money. It's not only about money. It's about kind of science that is absurd. Right. Well, is it kind there. of is. I mean, you're not going to have a flagship for, you know, half a billion or the reason The reason you're willing or the country is willing to pay so much money is because of the kind of science these observatories are doing. So they are not designed to run one experiment. They are not designed to do, you know, one area of astrophysics. They are designed to, to make contribution, you know, across astronomy and produce what... what Thomas the booking calls civilization level science. Civilization level science. I like that. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, let me go. Condor Boss has another really good question. So I'm, you guys are driving this hangout. I'm really happy about this. Um, is the universe X-ray transparent enough for us to see, for us to detect X-rays from the early universe? Right. I quickly responded on the chat. So the answer oh, is did. yes, it's fully transparent. And oh, you did. Moreover, it's fully transparent to the stuff that goes onto the black hole. So that stuff can be dense and, for example, can easily blanket the optical emission. But for X-rays, that stuff is transparent. Yeah, and it's also important to note, for those of you who don't know, X-rays really can't be observed here on the ground. So this needs to be a space-based observatory mm -hmm. uh, for the um, for the uh, uh, being able to see these wavelengths at all the Luckily, good for us, uh, the atmosphere keeps x-rays from, from hitting the ground. Um, Peter Quinn wants to know, he's my Geordie, he's from Newcastle in the, in the UK, so he's my Geordie friend. He wants to know if, uh, the, if ESA and the UK are involved in any way with links. Or is, is, is it too early for that collaboration partnership thing? Yeah, it, it's it's early. I mean, we don't have a, we don't have any partnerships um, specifically yet. But um, ESA is developing another X-ray mission right now called the Athena uh, Telescope, and it's it's in development. Um, it is uh, not as you know, it's not going to be as capable as Lynx, but uh, it does have some some similar uh, technology on, on some of the instruments. Okay. So we don't have we don't have partners identified. But NASA does try hard, doesn't it, to once it gets these things going to get international uh, collaborations going whenever it can. Isn't that true? 
I mean, it's certainly done it with with everything it's done so far. So it's something. Right. I mean, it's oh, go, go ahead. ahead. So I was going to say is it's too early to define, you know, precise terms of collaboration. So there's no, you know, no plans right now for hardware, the type of things. But we do have strong connections to Europe, and in fact, you know, couple one of our team members is in fact now based in Britain. Okay. Well, then what do you have to have together, and what do you have to have ready? Uh, for a decision to be made. Let's talk about that. Do you, uh, uh, you need to know your science. You have to have your science defined, which, Alexi, you're a part of, the definition team for that. Uh, and you, what, how far, maybe, Kevin, you can comment on how far the design has to go. I've got all these animations. I can show one if you want. Of, of yeah, yeah. Show the exploding piece. Okay. Yeah. All right. It is now up. And we're not we're not following it here, so we're just gonna have to pretend. Yeah, that. I hopefully you're familiar enough with it to see. But yeah. what it's doing is opening up the it's opening up the aperture and it's exploding out. Yeah, I can speak from the engineer's perspective on what our input is to the final report and the decadal decision. Okay. Uh, we want to show a feasible conceptual design that meets all of our driving science requirements. And our goal is to have that design be very low risk conservative with lots of margin and then that design also has to as Karen said close analytically we have to be able to show that our design can meet our requirements including our constraints like from launch vehicles uh, in addition to meeting our size requirements and then that design has to be detailed enough to drive down any risk areas and also to support the cost estimate so that's kind of in a nutshell what the engineers are contributing to the decadal the, the decision making. Okay, so as I'm watching as I'm watching this uh, animation go, um, I am, there's a few things that look very familiar to me. One of them is the objective, I guess you call it the objective lens, wouldn't you? I mean, you don't, can you comment a little on how x-rays are focused? This looks a lot like what Chandra does uh, to focus x-rays, but it doesn't use mirrors because, right, they're x-rays, they, they're hard to reflect. Well, it's a, Alexa can probably uh, respond better, but uh, it, it, is a, it is a mirror assembly, and the way the x-rays work is it's a, a grazing incidence optic, and so the photons come in, they bounce off uh, one mirror, and then it, then it bounces off another mirror, that, and then the combination of those, of those two mirrors around the cylinder focuses it down to the length, of, or down the focal length of the telescope. Right, so, so I guess where I'm going with this, so a grazing incidence, that, this, that cone, isn't it? That sort of right. cone yeah, shape. Yeah, creates, creates a cone, right. And then, and then those photons get focused at the focal plane, which is where the instrument and the detector are, and then that's when they, the detectors do all of their work. Okay. And, uh, so our instruments are at, at the back end of the telescope. Our optics are at the fore end of the telescope. Good, good, okay. And uh, do you want to comment a little bit about the instruments themselves? Like I'm seeing an ISIM uh, module, is that right? And the gratings? You want to right yeah so we ha so we have we have three instruments on on links two of those are focal plane instruments so that's the microcalorimeter and the uh hdxi the high definition x-ray imager and so when we want to do science that involves uh those two one of those two instruments the the those two are mounted on a translating table that we can move in and out of the focal plane and then the other instrument is the gratings and um that's a spectrometer instrument. And the detector for the gratings is on the, the ISOM, I mean, on the, the, the stable yeah. part of the, of the ISOM, so it doesn't move. But the gratings themselves are mounted just aft of the optics, and they can move in and out of the focal plane as necessary for whichever science uh, observation we want to do. Great. So we've got yeah. different, different observations that we can make, different science that we want to do, depending on which instrument is in the focal plane and which instrument. And this, is what, and this is what makes Lynx a flagship or a great observatory, that uh, it, like the other three, the other three mission concepts, it's got a broad range of capabilities to undertake a broad range of priority science goals. Right. Yeah, that's true, uh, Harley, because when we were talking with some of the other ones, they were very specific, weren't they? We had EXO, I'm sorry, we had uh, Origin Space Telescope that was designed to look at a very specific uh, 
time of the universe, and we had uh, ex a uh, Habax, which is designed to look specifically for habitable exoplanets. So, yeah, it does seem to, and then Louvoir might be the other one, though, that maybe is a little more general purpose. It certainly spanned a lot more wavelengths. Well, uh, I wanna, we want to be a little bit careful here that um, all of the missions have a one, two, or three, and, and again, Alexi, please feel free to correct me. All of the missions have two or three or four really, really compelling science goals. I mean, the sort of um, knock your socks off science mm -hmm. goals. And at the, at the same time, they have a broad range of other capabilities to achieve other multiple or a wide range of other science goals. They're really very broadly capable, um, but especially that handful of most important science goals. Okay, I want to ask Condor Boss this question because I really like it. Um, how hard is it to improve resolution on X-ray telescopes? What's the big factor for resolution? Is it just diameter of the app of the aperture, or is it the t detectors as well? So interestingly, we are. It's not detectors; it's the mirrors. So interestingly, for Chandra, the things like diffraction in the optics, so diameter did not play a role. For links, we are not very far from being, you know, diffraction limited in the X-rays. Can you explain uh, what that means? Direction? Well, it means uh, if you have a small area working, you know, of the mirror working, then the angle is, uh, the minimal angle it can focus to is the ratio of wavelengths to that size. And if you look at the X-ray mirrors, individual pieces of glass that reflect X-rays in the Vinx mirror, and you look, I mean, it's working on grazing incidents. So you're looking at it from the top. It's a you know couple of millimeter wide structure. So that couple of millimeter wide structure uh, focuses to half an arc second. That's not very far from you know the ratio of X-ray wavelengths to the you know this couple of millimeters. Good. Yeah, and so I guess. That's the in it. Uh, um, and is, and, and that's another, is it another way of saying that is that it's the best you can get for the optics that you've got. If you're diffraction limited, then you're yeah. limited by your optical train, not not your yeah. wavelength. So there's still a factor of a few to go from where, you know, Link's target is to diffraction limit. I'm just saying it's interesting that in the x-rays we... we uh, didn't use to worry about diffraction, and you know we we should start worrying about diffraction <laughs> because you so know, you, big, you weren't approaching the that limit. Drive from for links was to make those mirrors much thinner. So Chandra, you know, these are the one of the best mirror surfaces produced by humanity. You know, but they are uh, on uh, on substrates which are one inch thick, um, and so we cannot pack. Uh, those mirrors, gender tight mirrors, tight enough to to accumulate effective areas that we need for for the link sensitivity. So what we are studying is how can you make a similar quality of the optical surface on much thinner substrates. So our technology that will go into the design reference mission uses 0.5 millimeter thick substrates. So going from you know one inch to 0.5 millimeters, that's the kind of change we are making. Okay. Now, you can ask how hard it is to make those surfaces even better than 0.5 arc seconds. And so, and we ask these questions of ourselves a lot. And the best sense of, uh, of the teams who work on the optical technologies is that as we try to push beyond 0.5 arc seconds or, you know, to, to find a resolution than 0.5 arc seconds, the amount of new inventions that they will have to make in the optical technologies will explode. So the sense is on thin substrates, it looks like it's pretty doable to reach 0.5 arc seconds, but uh, pushing to 0.1 arc second, for example, will, will mean you know, a lot of new inventions and will start violating uh, diffraction limits. Okay, but you're confident you can get to that, to that limit that, that in X-rays? We have seen a lot of progress in the past year in this area, and so we are growing a lot more confident. Okay. Yep. All right. Well, let me go. Uh, thank you, Galaxia, by the way, for highlighting John's comment. Uh, I do see it, and I will ask it now. 
can your present by the way guys thank you for doing this for, for asking lots of questions this helps it it's help, this is what we're here for we're here for you to get access to these astronomers i'm glad you're asking all these questions can your presenters go into more detail on the potential application of this space teles this space telescope to the study of exoplanet and exobiology what in particular would be studied in the x-ray band anybody want to right. comment on that I can take it. Okay. So <laughs> we uh, we won't have an ability to see X-rays from planets themselves. Uh, we, but we will be able to uh, study very well the effect of stellar activity can might have on the planets in those systems. So in our own solar system, for example, we know that the uh, there's no life on Mars at present because the atmosphere is thin and it got thin because of uh, solar wind. So in other systems, powerful X-ray flares from the host stars could affect uh, chemistry in the atmosphere, could affect whether the atmosphere survives or not. So the very, uh, you know, the, the, the definition of habitability of planets needs to be expanded from just looking at you know whether or not the liquid water can exist on the atmosphere. So <laughs> there's, there's an aspect of stellar activity which can have very profound effect on the stellar habit on the planet habitability, and this is the question that links will be able to nail it down. Now that is an important question. So yes, a lot of these new planets that we're all very excited about, things like Proxima b and and all of these other planets or Trappist one. These are around active stars that are presumably giving out lots of uh, energy. And so links will help us understand that kind of emission from these stars, which will affect um, habitability. Mm -hmm. So that's good. Okay, i got to ask this question. you got to understand something about my audience, guys. Uh, they are exomoon nuts. I don't care if I have a hangout on Earth-facing weather satellites. I'm going to get a question about exomoons. So here we go. <laughs> Our moon is known for reflecting... Uh, X-rays from the sun. Uh, can links be used to detect the first exomoon? Now, this goes back to your question. I'm sure it's related to what you just, the answer is the same as about exoplanets. But what about reflected X-rays? Yeah, in, in, in exomoons, we won't be able to see them. There's plenty of interesting X-ray signs in our own solar system. So, you know, magnetic field around Jupiter, uh, uh, charge exchange between solar wind and the interstellar medium. So these areas we will study. So we will, what we will do as links is to understand really well using observation of our own solar system and other active stars is what the stellar activity can potentially do to the planets. Okay. Um, Hans Milling's got a really good question I'm, uh, that has to do with building these space telescopes. Um, he's asking, are you afraid that all those mechanical elements will fail at some point, maybe even before the telescope uh, is fully operational. Uh, do you use experience from Hubble on this matter? If so, which? Kevin, maybe you can take that one? Yeah, I can take a stab at it and, and Alexi and Karen join in. Uh, I'm not sure I'd go back as far as Hubble. I mean, we can take a lot of our spacecraft design heritage from Chandra. Um, as someone said in an earlier meeting, X-ray telescopes you know, tend to look like ice cream cups. Uh, there's a lot of similarity in the way your observatory ends up looking. Um, I'm personally not worried about mechanisms failing uh, early. We have a lot of experience in high reliability mechanisms. Uh, we are designing to eliminate any single faults that could affect our science capability. Uh, that we have redundancy, we have high reliability. I think we are making sure that we apply lessons learned from Chandra in particular, and applying that to, to links. You know, Chandra's been hugely successful. Uh, we can learn a lot from Chandra and make links even better. And as Karen said, you know, even though we're planning a five-year mission with 20-year consumables, uh, you know, with slightly degraded performance, we can expect a much longer mission than that. How will uh, uh, links be, will it be pointed using hydrogen, hydrogen jets? Is that the consumable or what, how will it point? Is it momentum? Propulsion is, is the primary uh, consumable is our fuel. Okay. And That's there will be some degradation in the solar uh, panel capability over time, but the primary consumable is propulsion, correct? 
Okay, and has this got uh, any kind of origami component to it? Is it going to fit in a rocket nicely, or are you going to have to do a lot of folding? I'm pretty sure that um, the solar arrays are going to have to be folded, but anything else? Yeah, yeah the solar panels are pretty much the only thing that, that fold up. It fits pretty nicely in there. Well, do, do, you, do you think about what rocket's going to be used yet, or is it too early? It's too early. I mean, we're, we're launching in the 2030s, and right now we don't really have that. <laughs> Who knows what's going to be? <laughs> yeah, we don't we don't have a vehicle yet that's going to that's defined for it. We're not necessarily we don't necessarily need an SLS, at least not the large one. Um, but we are looking at um, possibly being co-manifested on a a Block One B SLS. So that means that we would have to shorten our overall length um, to fit inside that volume. So we're looking at actually doing an extendable optical bench so that we can like you know push the telescope to a smaller length, and then when we uh, deploy, we'll extend to the full length. Uh, but we don't have a specific launch vehicle yet. We just know we have a specific mass we're trying to hit to Sun Earth L2. Okay. All right. And uh, I, I I know I'm getting ahead of myself, but it's a lot of this is very. Oh, we we lost um, Alexi. Yeah. Uh, oh, okay. Uh-oh. Here he comes. Oh, here he comes. Phew. Okay. Um, good. Hi, Alexi. It's good to have you back. <laughs> so <laughs> the um, the uh, uh, I suppose it's too early to talk about deployment, all of that stuff. But like, how long it's going to take couple of weeks to get to L2, I imagine, but that, is it way too early to talk about that stuff? Like deployment and commissioning? Yeah, we're looking at our crib sheet. Yeah. Uh, we have a couple of different options on how to get uh, to our you know, science orbit, uh, and that depends a lot on which launch vehicle we end up riding on. We've done a lot of different trade studies on uh, basically, you know, direct insertion, parking orbits around the Earth first. Uh, we can you know, either, there's a trade between the amount of propulsion we carry and how long it takes us to get to our science orbit. Uh, but yeah, it's going to be a while to get out there. It's a, I think it's about 100 days is sort of a, a pretty good ballpark. Okay. Um, so, okay, roughly 100 days. Let's, so, so Chandra is up there now. Um, been up there. How long has it been up there? Has it been like 20 years? 50? 20 years. Next year, it will be 20 years. Wow. Can you believe that? That's amazing. And it's held up pretty well, hasn't it, um, Alexi? Has it yep. really? I mean, the yep. detectors seem to be working and all of that stuff, right? Yep. Yep. Uh, so will there be, do you think? I mean, what's the prognosis for Chandra, first of all? And wouldn't it be great to have them both up at the same time? Uh, we... As much as I love Chandra, we won't need Chandra when Wings is up there. Okay, <laughs> so this is a you're thinking this is a replacement then. This is this, this is this is this thing is hundred times more powerful. Okay, okay. poor old Chandra. Yeah. Uh, the prognosis is good, I think. You know, they they looking at the health of the spacecraft and and it's slow to aging, but everything is manageable. And so as far out as we can see, you know, it should be operational. Okay, and I'm going to remind everybody, you guys, everybody's talking about JWST and freaking out about how it's not going to be re- re- serviceable, and we can't, oh my God, we can't repair it, we can't repair it. This is two now, two space telescopes that have been up, actually, if you count if you count Kepler even more, these are, we've got SOHO that was launched the same year as the Hubble Space Telescope, or the year later, and we've got Chandra, which has been up there for 20 years, neither of one of which. SOHO's at the L1 point, and Chandra's at the, wherever it's at, I don't know off the top of my head. And neither one of them have been serviced at all, and they're still up there, still providing data. So it, we have precedent. We can make telescopes run for decades without their needing serviceability. Now, Hubble did enjoy a lot of that because it was designed right. for that. But for the telescopes that aren't, we have good experience. Kepler was designed, what, for five years? And here we are nine years later. That mm-hmm. thing, I'm, I'm sorry, but but Kepler, what they've done with that is nothing short of miraculous. I will, I will, I'll throw in Spitzer. That's the, the Ah, IR. that's right, Spitzer. Right. Now, it, it ran out of cryogens, but lasted longer than was expected on cryogens and still has, I think it may be in its last year now of operations, that's been around 15 years. So serving is highly desirable. It is not absolutely essential if you design your mission right. Yeah, that's right. And I think Spitzer, even though it's out of its cryogenic uh, coolant, it's still up there taking images, isn't it, Hardy? It is. Isn't it still taking data? Yeah. I mean, yeah. and and, yes. and and Kepler would be too if it had enough gas. And I think it actually is. It's on fumes right now. 
<laughs> but uh, although, although let me let me ask our our guests a question: the um, missions that the big missions, the big flagship missions, are required by Act of Congress to be serviceable. Mm -hmm. Which maybe was I wonder if that was one of the reasons that you chose the orbit that you did, <laughs> and, but what is the serviceability? What's the aspect of um, of links that's serviceable? Yeah, we're we're doing some trade studies on that right now. Um, for the spacecraft itself, we're looking at grapple fixtures and uh, docking targets and and possible uh, refueling ports, but and then possibly you know replacement of a solar panel. But we're looking at you know what it would take to do those kinds of things. Uh, but you know to to get to get uh, to a telescope that's in Sun Earth L2 and do the servicing is it's quite a complex maneuver because I believe you have to take it out of L2 and rendezvous with another vehicle and do the servicing and, and insert it back. So uh, there's a there's a lot of uh, other work that would have to go on to completely service a mission like this, but we are doing what we can right now in the design to make it serviceable. And does that add a lot to the complexity? I mean, I mean, does that, that requirement is pretty, uh, it seems to me like a pretty broad requirement, but does it add a yeah. lot of complexity to your to your design? Yeah, I mean, it, it can, depending on how you want to go about it. I mean, we're not we're not necessarily planning on, you know, replacing instruments on orbit, but, um, you know, some, you could, you could make your instruments ORUs and, and, and do those replacements, but that would make it very complex and very expensive. But, um, you know, I think that the, the, the simple things, you know, if you look at, if you look at what, you know, tends to drive a mission in its, in its life is, you know, propulsion. So, uh, and also power. And so if we look at those those two primary things on the spacecraft and we make that serviceable, then we'll probably be doing pretty good. Yeah, we so when you say you all say propulsion, it's station keeping. Right, station keeping. Uh, uh, the, the the orbit that our colleagues and many others are talking about is a semi-stable orbit. So it requires station keeping to remain in the orbit. Right. Yeah, yeah we did a hangout with a company uh, that is trying to fill that need where they're going to, you know, oh, have, yeah. have a way of, uh, uh, servicing, uh, all of this, not just the low earth or orbit satellites, but some of these space telescopes as well and get them refueled, which I think is a pretty interesting idea. Um, John is that, I, I see you, even though you don't use the, um, the question mark, John, I can see you to what extent will the public be able to participate in the Lynx project? Will there be opportunities for citizen science somehow? And could you open up the telescope for astronomy students or amateurs? Anyone? Um, yeah, I think right now we are thinking that we will follow the uh, the model that Chandra implemented. So time is open for all astronomers to propose. I think they don't really formally run the you know the checks on the proposers so even you know even members of general public can propose as long as they can you know um, as long as they can formulate a nice uh, idea for science observations well okay so that that's a good point so there'll be a time allocation committee for this that right. decides who gets to use it and those are highly right. competitive <laughs> so you, better, right. you better have a good right. use case folks right uh, we do have examples on chandra when uh when you know proposers basically left academia and uh, and went to teach in high schools and then they involved uh, high school students you know, in analyzing the data. So one of the neutron stars uh, was discovered this way, basically uh, as a high school student project. Uh, we do have a very vigorous uh, education and public outreach program when, you know, students can use real gender data to learn about astronomy. And so it's not necessarily, you know, analyzing new observations, but we do support the teaching activities. Interestingly, I presume, and you guys certainly must have thought about this, there will be a Lynx deep field. Yes. Oh, or this, ultra, is, ultra this, deep is, this is one of our pillars, right? Right, exactly. So that might produce, one would expect, that it would produce a lot of data, a lot of images, and exciting images that the public may want to take a look at the, their own selves and see what their own talents are in identifying interesting structures and so on and so forth. There's been a lot of public interest. I don't know if there's been public citizen science, a lot of public interest in the Hubble deep fields. Oh, yeah. 
I'll just point out that the way a lot of citizen science projects are done is they 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 take data from uh, uh, observatories and and telescopes that weren't designed specifically for that purpose. They put the get the data together in a way that can be packaged as a citizen science project, and that's what Zooniverse does. I mean, they used I think they started with Sloan Digital Sky Survey data for Galaxy Zoo, and then you were supposed to ca you know the citizens were supposed to classify the galaxies. Uh, Sloan wasn't designed as a citizen science mm -hmm. instrument, but they were able to grab all those galaxies and put right. them in a way that they could. So there's nothing to prevent this data from links to be used in this way um, by someone who's enterprising. Will the data be like other observatories in the sense that when people get it, there's an embargo of about a year and then it becomes public or will it be public right away? Or again, is it too early to talk about that? Our working assumption is that it will be just like as customary now. So there's about six to one year period when only people who actually did the observation have access to the data. For things like deep fields, uh, probably the access will be provided immediately. But I think we will just follow the general NASA guidelines for uh, for data rights on those missions. Sure. And sure. those probably will evolve. They do evolve in the in the direction of data becoming public sooner rather than later. Okay. All right. Let me, uh, Larry Keyes has I got a question about propulsion. Have you guys considered using any electric propulsion? Kevin, maybe? Currently, currently no. Okay. And is that just because it's not very, it's, it's good for getting you places, but not necessarily good for pointing you around the sky, right? Yeah, that's generally correct. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I don't work uh, electric propulsion myself. I have a little bit of experience with electrodynamically propulsive tether projects, which only work in the planetary magnetic field. Uh, but yeah, in general, for the kinds of propulsion needs that we have, I don't think electric propulsion would be the best fit. All right. Uh, okay. So, Karen, um, how how how? Yeah. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. What? Did I, miss I, was, I was wondering what the TRL was with the electric propulsion. One of the things that we're trying to do with, with links is make sure, especially on the spacecraft, is that it's, it's all very high TRL or technology readiness level components to make it a very, very simple and also inexpensive spacecraft uh, and also very reliable. So we're really trying to stick with, you know, um, very, very known, uh, well-known and used technologies to reduce the cost and make it more reliable. So I would think that electric propulsion, I mean, I'm not a propulsion person at all, but I would think that that would be a little bit, a little bit riskier um, in the, in the overall design. So we're, we're going with standard stuff. Yeah. And that's something I want to ask you about, Karen, because you reminded me, yeah. this is something I'm getting more and more interested in, especially as we watch the JWST mission unfold. This idea of risk assessment that you do with, within a mission planning stage, like you're on right now, how do you determine what is risky and what is okay? You said TRO. You want these things to be, uh, I'm sorry, what was TRO again? TRO, technology readiness level. Technology readiness. Uh, you want them to be a high TRO. Um, but what other factors go in? I mean, that, which means, you, you know, if you can use off-the-shelf stuff that's been proven, do it. Um, mm -hmm. But what other factors go into a risk level? And what what do you shoot for uh, when, when you say, okay, we're like, we heard, I heard a 70% confidence level when it came to JWST and it was going to take another year or so to get there. Uh, and so what is that? What can you give us a sense of how you plan your risks? Yeah. So we use, um, we use kind of a, a standard risk definition. It's a, it's, you know, something that's, that's pretty commonly known within NASA. But it, it, you know, you take a look at the at the likelihood of something happening and the consequence of it happening. So, uh, if you feel like it's got a relatively low likelihood but a high consequence, it would have a, a certain risk value. If in you know, there's a it's a basically a five by five matrix that you look at, and so you can do an assessment of your technologies and you know overall mission and determine whether or not something is you know going to be a, a you know, relatively high risk. And then uh, those are the things that you want to mitigate. And you can you can put a probability on that. You can put a, a cost associated with it. And so that you know as you as you work through the project, you just you know work on those those mitigations and you know reduce your risk as, as you move along. And is there but a is there an overall is there an overall risk score uh, that you that that a mission can have? I or, or like a confidence level. 
when you add uh, up all yeah, the you risks? Can do a, you can do a probabilistic risk assessment to give an, an overall. Uh, we're not going to do that for our concept. I think that you would need that more at the, at the actual project level. Okay. But I mean, our biggest risks right now are associated with the development of our technologies because um, our optics and you know, all of our all of our technologies are you know relatively high, I guess, for this for this uh, point in the study. We're at TRL level three and four for all of our technologies. But you know, to get to the next level requires a lot of work, and uh, we have some. One of the you were asking earlier about you know the the study deliverables. And you know, one of the major components of the study is to deliver a technology development roadmap. And so that's where we identify all the technologies that we have that we are uh, developing for this mission. And that includes technologies associated with the three instruments and the optics. And to define how we're going to get from where we are right now at TRL three or four to TRL six, which is um, associated with our preliminary design review for the mission. And then ultimately we have to get a TRL nine, which is space flight ready. Oh, see. So, so the higher the number, the better, right? Correct. correct. Okay. All right. And um, you know, we're, we've got teams who are diligently working on the maturation of all of our technologies right now. And they're also diligently working on their uh, technology roadmap so we can include that in our work. Okay. So I will add to the engineering side, uh, we want all the exciting things and links to be in the mirrors and the instrument. We're really designing a very conservative, robust, low-risk spacecraft. So that is kind of our, our goal as far as uh, the engineering perspective. I see. Okay. Harley, this may be a loaded question. You can just say I don't want to answer it if you don't want to. But do you know uh, how these different four missions compare in that way? Are there are some more risky than others? Or is there just no way to know well, it's yet? It's a bit of a loaded question. Some are more. And, and this is something I know about. Um, but not sufficiently deeply to, okay. to well, I thought... say it anything more than some are more risky than others. Sure. Okay. All right. And, and, and by the way, I've got to give uh, kudos um, to the Lynx team because they are, are well known to be being very conservative and they are, they are identifying and, and, and Karen and Kevin, am I describing this right? They've identified their technology needs early and they're, they are using options that are reliable and conservative and well understood. Ah, okay. That's definitely our approach. Okay. Um, so I've got a got a couple of questions on uh, Twitch here that I, I just checked out. Um, we asked about if data will be open access after some embargo period. Uh, we've already asked that question, and the answer is that we're going to follow NASA guidelines on this. Probably it'll be embargoed for a year is usually what happens so that the uh, pr pr principal investigators can – uh, uh, write their papers and things like that, then it'll be available. Um, and uh, 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 let's see. Um, any lessons? Okay, here's one, another one from High Altitude uh, Cherenkov uh, on Twitch. Any lessons from Hitomi, especially regarding software verification? I don't know what you that means. You might want to explain what's, yeah, you might want to explain, and I'm probably, well, actually, any three, any one of our three guests can probably explain what's behind that. Okay. Alexi? Well, I don't have a very intimate understanding, but my, my understanding was that there was uh, not enough planning for various uh, contingencies. And when a contingency happened, the software was not designed to deal with it properly. And so the spacecraft basically started to accelerate itself instead of you know, going into the safe mode. Uh, and, this was uh, a, a Japanese mission of about right, four right, years right. ago. It was, uh, I think it uh, it was launched about four years ago and lost about three years ago. Yeah, it was very, very disappointing. Right. So it did do uh, just two science observations. So I think NASA and, and Japan looked into lessons learned. Uh, and generally, uh, what the software and the level of verification that was done for Chandra is a lot higher than what was implemented for Hitomi, and that's just reflects different the difference in the cost category for those missions. So for Lynx, we expect to really follow the Chandra, uh, you know, design principles, uh, control principles, verification principles, and Chandra has operated extremely well in those situations. It, 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 it's gone into the safe mode several times during the mission. Everything was handled. Just example, right? Very good. All right, guys. Well, I wish you guys. Oh, go ahead, Karen. 
was going to say, just to follow up on that too, um, this, this is a concept study and uh, in, in uh, NASA project parlance, we are pre-phase A. So we're not even, you know, we're not actually in the, the project mode. We're way in the planning stages of it. And so for a specific software design, you know, we're at the point of designing software lines of code rather than actual software. So, I mean, one of the things that we have to really balance with this concept study is the level of detail that's appropriate to show that we have a, a feasible design. But we're not getting into super detailed design because, you know, that's just, that's just not necessarily appropriate for this level of a study. So, yeah. uh, no sense you know, of putting that much resources into something until you right, know for sure. Right. Yeah. Okay. Very good. All right, guys. Well, we are out of time. I'm going to go ahead and stop there. Let me just do one quick check of the live chat to make sure I got everybody. Uh, let's see. Um, no, I think I got them all. Let's see. Is there any way? Oh, oh, here's one. Uh, Neil, you and I'll, I'll, this will be the last question I ask. Uh, so let's see. The He is asking, is there any way uh, links can differentiate if... Is there any way links to differentiate if the edge of the universe is rushing away from us? Is the edge of the black hole we? I'm not sure how, what this what this is saying. Uh, is there any way can links differentiate the edge of the universe rushing away from us? Um, it's not going to be measuring any kind of redshifts or anything, right? Um, it can from spectra, even for high, you know, for large distances. But it's important to know that we are, you know, we will, with links in the X-rays, we will be able to reach to, you know, to distances which we normally would associate with the edge of, you know, modern universe, the universe of galaxies. So well into the epoch of the uh, first galaxy formation, we will be able to see, you know, in the X-rays with links. Okay, very good. Well, we'll stop it there. I want to thank everybody for uh, for uh, watching and hanging in there. You guys had some great questions. Thanks for helping drive this hangout. That's what we're all about. I want to thank my guest, Alexi Viklinen. He is the co-chair of the thank Science you. and Technology Definition Team. Uh, Kevin uh, McCarley, he's the uh, uh, sy lead systems engineer on the Lynx project. And Karen uh, Galmas, she is the Lynx study manager. Thank you guys all so much for being here and for taking time out. I know, Karen, you got to go. So uh, thank you for, again, taking time out. Uh, next week, I will be we will be back with Carol Christian in the Astro Coffee Hangout. I think we're still working on uh, the topic, so we don't have that fleshed out quite yet. Next Tuesday, we have Telescope Talk. We're back. We're going to be talking with members of, we're going to be talking with the owner of the Oceanside Photo and Telescope uh, Company in in. Uh, in California, where who are did, so if you're interested in amateur astronomy, there's your hangout right there. And I will talk to you guys uh, next week. So, on behalf of Harley Thronson, I want to thank you all so much for watching. And as always, keep looking up. Here we go. Oh, oh, oh. I, I, I always forget this. Sorry there. <laughs> I always forget. Go ahead. There you go. See, I have mine right here, too. <laughs> These are gravitational <laughs> wave rubber duckies. That's right. We got a gravitational waves. We this uh, that's our mascot. Uh, Yep. <laughs> okay, guys. Thank you, guys. I actually have to go too. Oh, okay. Thank you. Pleasure as always. So, thank right. you, Alexi. Mm -hmm. Talk to you here.